the Seafair. Uh, the building background, very, very keen, very helpful for a lot of the literary pieces that we have throughout this year. Um, you may or may not have picked up on that, the switch in mood from line six, was it 63 to 64? 64, right around there. Um, you may have picked up on it on your own. You may not have. Um, but hopefully with that background, uh, you're able to be on the alert of it a little bit more, um, give you a little bit greater understanding. The building background will be vital um, when we get down the road in the Renaissance and stuff with some sonnets and poems and here and there, where it gives us a little, oh, a little bit of background on the author and that individual's connection to the person in the poem. And otherwise, we might miss out on the in all that subtext um, that you'd say, oh, it's still an okay poem, I still get it, but it means a little bit more and there's a little bit more uh, substance behind it or under it um, in that case. So uh, with this, um, we see a, a big change. And first off, we see very darkness, very uh, rough existence. Um, the very first line, this tale is true and mine. Uh, so it's a real, you know, a, 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 a retelling. And again, we don't know who the author is, similar to Beowulf, it's, it's unknown. Um, if this was a story that was passed around, uh, a speech passed around, the way that this reads, especially with the second half uh, in play, it, it comes across kind of like preachy, kind of like a sermon, uh, where one could you know, tell a story and then there's a moral to the story. Um, and whoever wrote this, uh, the monk sat down, the controversy is, it's two different people. Controversy is that there's this story and so he wrote down the first two pages. And then he looks, no one's around, no one's around, Let's put some Christianity into it, and let's make this a moral and a lesson. And so scholars have argued that it is two different people because it is so different. Um, look on page 75. Just some of the words and phrases just pop out. Uh, showed me suffering. The you know something in sorrow showed me suffering. Um, you know it tells the smashing surf when I sweated in the cold of an anxious watch. So when I'm on watch, when I'm out here, you know at night. Darkness, if there's no moon, there's no light. Uh, unless, I guess they could have some little lanterns or something, but you know, in five, six, eight hundred, a thousand AD, I don't know what they would truly have. Um, but, uh, and if there are no stars, it'd be really dark. And they need to be out there to listen for the sounds of waves breaking over reefs, maybe other ships, other boats, things they could run into. They don't have radar or sonar to keep track of that stuff. Um, you've seen it in movies and pirate ship movies where they go up in the crow's nest. And so they could look out, and then they could see if it's getting too shallow. Oh, steer to the right. You know, they can do that. But in darkness, if you're on watch, you're the only one out there. In darkness, just hearing the waves into the ship, if the ship is still moving. If it's not, you're just sitting there in darkness. Think about that. Have you ever been in a pitch black situation? You know, I mean, just pitch black. I'm not talking about your bedroom where, oh, well, the street light kind of comes through a little bit, or my night light. If it's not plugged in, it's pretty dark. No, I mean like pitch black. You know, here he would be in almost pitch black, and you would just hear the ocean. Or if there's no nothing at all. I mean, it'd just be kind of freaky, kind of alone. Um, and so he says that it was so nerve-wracking and so bad and horrible that, you know, he sweated in the cold. You're not supposed to sweat when you're cold. Okay, so it shows you that he had some concerns there. He talks about a hardship groaned around my heart. Hunger tore at my sea-weary soul. No man sheltered on the quiet fairness of earth can feel how wretched I was. No man alive can feel how horrible I feel. Okay, life has passed me by. He goes on in the next page and so on, talking about how, you know, the seasons change, spring, summer, things bloom, everything's great. But out here on the water, really the seasons don't change. Temperature might go up or down a little bit, right? The wind still is the same. Storms could come in. But you don't get to experience that, you know, the springtime. You know, there's going to be a day in mid-March where it gets really nice. And the baseball team can finally go outside, and softball, can finally go outside out of the gym. And it's just hot ah, spring. But then it will snow again later on. But you have that day or two. It's just really nice. And you get to experience, you know, the blossoming trees. And you get away from all the dead-looking hibernating trees and plants, and there's that season change, and then, ah, the optimism. He doesn't get to experience any of that, and so it's just perpetual misery and hardship, and no man on earth can feel how wretched I truly am. Um, 
Page 76, another line talking about a soul left drowning in desolation. Just there's no hope. Um, you know, I wish that I would be, you know, on land. Well, you do get to go on land, but then we go right back out again. He has no body. He has nothing. And it's not a great existence. It's like if, if you were grounded some weekend and you know that, oh, we were going to go to the game and then go out afterwards and then go to so-and-so's house and, and you know that all your friends are doing it, but you are at home because of whatever reason. You're pretty miserable. You're pretty angry, upset, and you want to be elsewhere. You're like, 735, tip off. Oh, now they're out at wherever, and now they're at whomever's house, and you're pretty miserable, pretty rough. Um, and he has these thoughts, these feelings. Um, if you look down at, yeah, lamenting about summer and, and the cuckoo and the singing, and we don't have any of this, around 55 to 60 and so on, and all of these things, just miserable. It's horrible. No one has feel how wretched I am. And so now we have this shift, and that's where you change over. Because instantly it goes, thus the joys of God are fervent with life, where life itself fades quickly into the earth. The wealth of the world neither reaches to heaven nor remains. And here's where we can kind of start to see kind of a sermony, kind of a preachy, kind of a moral to it, um, where, you know, whatever you have here on earth, you can't take it with you. The money you have, the wealth you've accumulated, you're not going to get to take it. Because people do things in their life. People live a certain way, make decisions a certain way in order to accrue all this wealth, all this standing. And some of it might not be the way that God wants you to behave and act. Well, but I need to provide. I need to get all this money. So, well, you can do that, but you're not going to be able to take it with you. There are some cultures, uh, what, Egyptians? Don't they, um, you know, they tomb them up, the big pharaohs and stuff. And what do they put in there? A bunch of junk. Money. Spices things for the afterlife so you can have a comfortable existence and that's their their beliefs and so on whether it happens whatever who knows but here they're saying that you can't take any of that so no matter how you live your life you're not going to take it so you need to live your life by a certain set of principles and everybody kind of knows what that is down the lines of Christianity um, there's a line coming up about kind of like the golden rule treat others as you want to be treated things like that um, and they say something similar. Um, the days are gone when the kingdoms of earth flourished in glory. Now there are no rulers, no emperors, no givers of gold as once there were. When wonderful things were worked among them and they lived in lordly magnificence, those powers have vanished, those pleasures are dead, the weakest survives, and the world continues, kept spinning by toil. Goes on to say that the soul is stripped of its flesh, knows nothing of sweetness or sour, it feels no pain, bends neither in hand nor its brain. A brother opens his palms and pours down gold on his kinsman's grave, strewing his coffin with treasures intended for heaven. But nothing golden shakes the wrath of God for a soul overflowing with sin. It's kind of a neat line. Nothing golden shakes the wrath of God for a soul overflowing with sin. There's a famous song by Led Zeppelin called Stairway to Heaven. You've heard of it, maybe, a little bit, hopefully. If not, ask your folks, grandparents about it. It's pretty good. Um, but there's a line, you know, and there's and so and so is buying a stairway to heaven. You can't buy a stairway to heaven. This money doesn't do you anything. The only thing that can get you up, you know, in the VIP area, up that escalator, up that stairway to heaven is to live a certain way. The money trying to bribe God, that doesn't work too well. And that's what they're saying. Um, there's a line 106 that I like. Death leaps at the fools who forget their God. It's kind of like one of those mantras, you know, one uh, should try to remember in order to live your life accordingly. You know, death leaps at the fools who forget their God. Um, I was driving down south once, and I saw these billboards on the side of the road. You may have seen them around. I don't know if they're around here, but all it was was a just billboard with um, the words, what was it, uh, are you lost, question mark, God. Next one was, turn here to find your way, God. 
And then if you turned right at that next exit, there was a big church there to kind of welcome you, that type of thing. But they use these spiritual sayings and different things like that to get you thinking about living your life all the time in a certain way. And this is one of those things that just kind of, I don't necessarily want to say it would be a scare tactic, but yet you throw that up on a billboard or a bumper sticker, people would probably start to take notice a little bit. Um, but death leaps at the fools who forget their God. He who lives humbly has angels from heaven to carry him courage and strength and belief. So those individuals that, even if you're wealthy and stuff, you still need to be humble. You still need to live your life a certain way. And if you struggle, if your life just seems horrible, kind of like the guy, the sailor, the, the speaker, you will have strength and courage brought to you by angels. You will be protected. Think about what is going to happen after this life. Look at the goal. Look at the end of the race, what ultimately is there, and you shouldn't be sad about it. You should be positive, okay? But you need to live your life a certain way. Um, I like this part here. A man must conquer pride, not kill it. So you can still be prideful, okay? You can still, as it goes on to say that, you know, be firm with this fellows. Treat all the world as the world deserves with love or with hate, but never with You can hate people. You can hate things. You can be angry, but don't do harm. Don't act upon it. Still have your, your morals and your understanding. Um, we're going to do a piece down the road, down the road, where um, you know, uh, somebody um, doesn't treat nature very well, and certain things happen to him as a consequence. Um, and the moral at the end was, you know, don't harm nature. Nature is an extension of God. If I wanted you to harm that thing, I would have told you to. You know, that type of thing. Um, and so these are all kind of the golden rules, and we see the positives, we see the light, and that's why these things are so different. The first half and the second half, that people, scholars have thought that it's two different people. Um, and I, I kind of tend to agree. We saw what, uh, you know, the Christianity and Beowulf, how that was sprinkled in, and we know a monk would have sat down and done that, and so it's pretty reasonable to think that they would do that here. Um, I had a young lady a year ago who said, uh, well, I kind of think it's the same person. I said, why? She goes, well, think about it. If it was a, a sermon or a speech being given, you know, you, you set it up for look how lost, look how destitute, look how, you know, nowadays we see stories all the time. So-and-so was on drugs or were homeless or miserable life, but they got things together when they found, you know, a calling, found the Lord, found whatever it was. And so by showing, and since it's a, a first-person account, um, they can speak with... Uh, pretty uh, uh, resounding uh, evidence. And so I, I kind of like that idea. Um, I don't know which way I go. It's not important. Um, the main thing is um, figuring out the mood and seeing how the mood definitely shifts from one half to the second half. Okay, that's pretty big and pretty important. 